Hi, for those of you who don't know by now, my name is Shannon Jackson and I'm the director of the Arts Research Center. And on behalf of ARC and the Berkeley Center for New Media and the David Brower Center, it is an absolute thrill and privilege to welcome you to social and community engaged work, the genuine and the artificial, a public lecture by public artist Rick Lowe. This is the fifth lecture in our series exploring the intersection between art, activism, and technology curated to respond to the 50th anniversary of the free speech movement here on our campus. As we have been thinking about activist legacies of that era, we've had a number of different models, activist models before us in this series. From the history recalled by SF, FSM activist and grateful lyricist and Electronic Frontier Foundation founder J.P. Barlow, to the formal precision of Maya Lin's ecological platforms, which are on view in the galleries out here, uh, to the community engagements around race and public health and environmental justice conceived by Brett Cook, to Ai Weiwei's large-scale installations on censorship and political imprisonment curated by Cheryl Haynes on Alcatraz Island. The series will continue all through 2015 with more reflections about aesthetic form and political form and movements for social justice amid new technologies and new economies. But today, it is a true thrill to be able to welcome someone who has been a public artist, architect, community organizer, a mentor, a visionary and inspiration, a national treasure, an international treasure for many of us who believe in the capacity of art to engage issues of social justice and to engage and redefine the public realm. Today is the first full day of actually a 10-day artist residency here at Berkeley for Rick Lowe, and we hope that you'll join us for other events. He's part of a lot of small and large events. In particular, we hope that you'll come back to the Berkeley Art Museum on Friday, November 21st, when we'll be hosting a public symposium around issues of art, housing, and social justice, and hope to have a longer public conversation about those issues with members of the Bay Area arts community and social justice community. So Friday, November 21st in particular, we hope to see you again in a different venue. As I'm sure most of you know, Rick Lowe is the central force behind Project Row Houses in the city of Houston. Like many artists, Lowe had a desire to address social and political inequities through the medium of his art practice and found himself dissatisfied with the models available to him. Project Row Houses came about when Lowe used his knowledge of African American architectural history and his awareness of neighborhood politics in Houston to repair a series of shotgun houses in the third ward of Houston. Rather than submitting to the gentrifying pressures of so-called urban vitalization, Rowe and his collaborators restored the neighborhood with the goal of enabling his neighbors to stay and to thrive. At the same time, the houses themselves were redefined by the artistic and social interactions developed inside them. The houses provided studio residence for artists who needed space and a residence for women who needed a safe place to live and to raise their children. Project Row Houses soon began providing housing and social interaction for elders, simultaneously creating an intergenerational community, a quasi-child care and after-school program, a public kitchen, a place to read, to play games, and a dynamic space in which to make more art. There are many artists, as we all know, from coming to these gatherings and so many others in our community who thematize social and political themes through their art practice. Lo is a leader amongst those for whom the social and political is not only about theme, but about form. And not only about form, but part of an interdependent and wider socio-economic and cultural and architectural system. Indeed, his practice is unique for the spatial range in which it imagines itself. Artists are not as deployed, are not deployed as temporary tools in the gentrification of a neighborhood. Rather, art is positioned as a central practice in the maintenance of equitable urban planning and social care. In thinking about my introduction for today, I looked over some documents that I uh, have had the privilege of, of writing about him in the past, and I found myself at one point calling him a genuine article, or the genuine article. Mm -hmm. 
Genuine isn't always the most popular adjective in the ever ironic art world. And so I'll be interested to, today to see what Rick means by that term, in part to help me understand what I meant by it. But I do think that part of what I meant has to do with what he and others have called the politics of staying. Rick Lowe has become a beacon for so many, long before the MacArthur, because he made the unusual, shocking, impossible decision to develop his site-specific practice in one place. By being willing to commit to place, despite the constant pressure on internationally renowned artists to leave. <coughs> he's been able to develop a cross-sector apparatus, a wide-ranging social service center, a center for ideas, and an influential artist residency. The creativity and efficacy comes in part from deciding to remain a neighbor. Lowe now functions as both anchor and sail for a network based in Houston and an, an international network that seeks to model his practices. And as such, I think he can also provide inspiration for those of us in the Bay Area who are also in the midst of rethinking our relationships across artistic, educational, industry, and social service sectors. I hope that you will join me in welcoming Rick Lowe. Um, thank you, Shannon, for that great introduction. And uh, you know, maybe I'll be able to talk about this uh, idea of genuine because it's—I uh, I have to say before I get started, I'll just tell you something. A friend of mine told me this um, that you know, if you're going to go out in the world and you're going to do something during the day, make sure you you uh, spend some time and wash your feet. Because if you're going to go out there doing something, you probably will put your foot in your mouth at some point. <laughs> so at least your feet are clean. <laughs> so, and so in this instance, um, uh, I'm, you know, it's a, it's a little nerve-wracking to, to make this presentation because, I mean, is it, I'm more comfortable when I'm just talking descript descriptively about my work, but when I'm trying to tie it within a, you know, a, a, lot of, a larger framework, it's it a little bit nerve-wracking to me. And, uh, and so I came up with this, this title because it was something that I was thinking about a lot, about this notion of, you know, what's, what's, what's genuine? What's the genuine purpose for making art, you know, and, uh, or, or working within community? And also, you know, how does, how does the whole thing of, of, you know, when, you know, the practice of art is generally, it, it rises above what the real thing is anyway? And so what's that relationship? And, not only the the, the, issue, the the works of genuine, because that's also I also connect that to the authentic. Um, uh, it can also be connected to me for the practical, because I always think about the relationship between the practical and the symbolic, or the aesthetic. So there are all these kind of um, dynamics that I think about, and uh, so unfortunately, I don't think I come to you today with the capacity to tell you really, you know, what's genuine. And you know what's artificial, you know, or 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 even why one may be one or the other, but um, but but what I am going to do is I'm going to try to just have a little conversation using my work to um, as a as a platform to talk about these things and how and and show some other things to just kind of um, talk about how I kind of go through my day thinking about art art making and how it influenced me and the work that I do. So I'm going to start with a couple of images that are um, uh, that probably you probably recognize this work. People, anybody recognize this work? <laughs> okay. Um, how about this one? Anybody recognize it? This work. Okay. Now, I mean, actually, you know, I thought someone else would catch me on this because I did this actually with a group of students one day, and uh, and actually, in reality, yes. Of course, the work at the top is Franz Klein, but the work at the bottom is a bunch of black women quilters from Alabama, G's Bend, right? And, um, and, and then in this one, of course, the lower, the, the lower one and the middle one, of course, Mondrian, but the ones at the top are these 
uh, kindergarten students from the 1800s. <laughs> and, um, you know, and so, so, you know, so, so I, you know, I'm really interested in this question about, you know, the authentic, I mean, the authentic or the genuine and the artificial, because, you know, I think there's a lot of, there are a lot of issues that are relevant in that, right? I mean, there's the question about the ethics around, you know, why someone chooses to make the work they do. You know, and, and what relationship they have to making the work, and also the politics behind you know, who gets to determine what is art and what's not. And I'll tell you, it is no, it's of no little importance who gets to make that decision. You know, and uh, because when you think of, when I think of things like, um, uh, well, uh, well, one of the things that I started to that got me thinking about this. <laughs> One of the things that got me thinking about this, or gave me a framework in which I could think about it, was uh, an article I was reading by Lucy Lepard. And it was on uh, land art. And, uh, and by the way, you know, it was an article that she was kind of being uh, a little bit critical of land art. In fact, at one point in the year, she said that land art is actually for city people. <laughs> and, and, uh, you know, and, and, and basically for the that reason that she no longer lives in the city, she lives in the in the open landscape where a lot of the landscape artists make their work, and it's like it seems super, superfluous for you know someone who lived there. So, so uh, but I like this thing the way she described um, uh, land art. You know that you know it's task land art is to focus landscapes that are often too vast for the unaccustomed eye to take in, and you know as I was thinking about that. That whole notion of focus, you know, that's a big part of kind of determining, you know, what is art, uh, and then there's a question of, you know, why someone focuses on it, and what it does in terms of the context of value, and so on and so forth. And um, um, and so I, I was thinking about it, you could take that same language, you can kind of, you can even put in like uh, Duchamp's ready mades right? That you know, the ready mades basically is the focus of the everyday object. Uh, that are often too mundane for the unaccustomed to take in, right? But and then it's, and it's interesting how when that focus happened, when, 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 when Duchamp makes that focus on these everyday objects, all of a sudden, an unimaginable amount of people have access to this, an interest in this you know, mundane object, right? So, um, you know, so this on the, on the right is just a, a, a screen uh, shot of a Google, of uh, just Googling urinal. Duchamp, and this is what comes up, right? I mean, so you get this whole notion of of, um, of, of the uh, the value of the urinal in a way that that you wouldn't imagine a mundane object like that would get. But there's a focus that he placed on it. So I also said that you could do the same thing with uh, socially and community engaged art, right? You know, if you say that it is to focus social and community actions that we've lost the capacity to take in. Uh, if you can make that focus, then all of a sudden you can kind of shift and, and shift how people look at things and think about them. So I also did a screenshot if I, uh, of uh, uh, Googling uh, uh, row houses low. And then all of a sudden, so, so you get this sense of like, you know, I mean, no one really, really, I mean, row houses, you know, what are, you know, didn't really have any real significance. But within the context of framing it uh, as an art project, and focusing on it, then it has a whole different kind of value. So with that, I started to think about, um, you know, the, the idea of basically of just, you know, what's what's valuable in the experiences that we see every day, you know, and and are there things that that may have a higher uh, value than we are accustomed to giving it, mainly because we haven't been able to focus on it. And so I started to look at different things and think about. Them. And I do it all the time um, uh, in my community and as I travel around and I see different things. So I'll show you just a few things here. Like this, this is a guy in, in the third ward, Houston. You know, and uh, he's, a, he's a little odd and quirky, but there's such a, there's a wonderful kind of spirit about him. And, uh, and, and there's a, this kind of unique quality that he has. It's almost, it's, it's very theatrical. And he's a, he's a, I often think that he's making personal performances for me, often. There was that, actually one day, I was standing, um, I was standing at the corner of Project Row Houses and he was walking on the opposite street and he decided when he got to the intersection that he would walk 
just catty corner across the intersection toward me. So he and he has a very stylish way of walking. He has a cigarette in his hand. He's walking, <laughs> and he came across the street and he stopped a few feet away. He puffed his cigarette. He flicked it, and then he turned and he walked. Away. <laughs> you know, I mean, um, and it was it was amazing to see that, right? I mean, this guy was just very. Uh, I mean, there's something poetic about that, you know. And so, you know, I can imagine. You know, a performance artist doing that, you know, and, and really getting lots of recognition for that. <laughs> <laughs> um, another another such uh, person is this guy. Um, uh, we we had to name this guy because he didn't talk to us a lot. He he just started showing up across the street from Project Four Houses. There's a bus stop on the corner here, and um, and he just started showing up and he would just clean and groom the. The, the grass and around the area. And he would do it for anywhere from six to ten hours. Often, sometimes he would, he would come maybe twice a month, at least once a month. And, uh, and sometimes he would have uh, a weed eater or something, but other times he would just have hand shears. And he would just be on the ground, you know, cutting stuff. And, uh, and when, you know, we'd always see him, and you see him like he looked like he's kind of a heavy guy, you know. And, uh, but, one day I was talking to him and we were trying to find out about a bus schedule and he lifted up that shirt and all of a sudden he had all this equipment in there, you know. You know but nobody, nobody ever got out of the to ask him what that silver thing was. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, but you know, you know, but this guy, he just, you know, he, he, he maintains this, this spot. It's his calling, you know, I mean, you know, is it genuine? Is it authentic? I mean, what is it about that? that drives him to do that. This is another one in Philadelphia. Uh, you know, I was walking down the street and I saw this guy and I was just amazed that he had this carefully tied rope around him and had this train of about 50 feet that was connected to a container. And he was just walking along, you know. And, and it was, I mean, and I was, um, and this was at a time I was visiting with Terry Atkins and, and I, you know, I couldn't wait to, to, to show him this, and we actually tried to find this guy, but we couldn't find him. But it was just such a, um, uh, a beautiful kind of moment there. And then there's, you know, people like this who are obviously trying to express something, you know, to the world in a way that, you know, in the way that he, you know, kind of carries himself around and, uh, and, uh, and display his own, you know, creative interests. But, and then so, and then so I, when I look at these people and I'm thinking about them, I'm also thinking about other artists. You know, I mean, artists who, who, who get loads of recognition, you know, for doing what they do as artists. And, uh, and it's very close to some of these things that I see on the street. You know, so the question is, you know, it's, you know, what's, what's the relationship between, you know, perhaps the authentic or genuine uh, uh, desires or motivation of someone to do this, and someone who's doing it, who could also be genuine as well, but it also is uh, is layered with a sense of uh, of artistic intent. And this on the left is uh, uh, one of my one of the artists that I've looked up to, and I've always enjoyed her work, Mary Ukulele, and um, and then of course Mr. Bentley on on the other side. Um, so when I started with Project Row Houses, you know, there was no doubt that the beginning parts of Project Row Houses was completely genuine and, uh, and, and authentic because I had no clue of what I was trying to do. I had no, no basis for thinking about it uh, beforehand in an artistic uh, context. And, uh, and so starting out you know, from that point of just really trying to figure out how do we help this community deal with the issue of blight uh, that's going on, and uh, and so 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 that was it. so so that was that's connected to that that notion when I talk about the practical and the symbolic. You know, I mean, there was a practical need in this neighborhood, and uh, and whether it was going to have any symbolic meaning, I don't know. But the drive was truly to address this this practical issue. But of course, there was a uh, from the start, there was a real interest of mine to figure out how do I connect this conceptually to my desire as an artist to uh, to, to layer meaning on things that I see that are that are practical, but they can also have a complexity that adds in um, different kind of meaning. 
Now, I'm going to go through a few uh, images that just kind of give a broad overview of Project Ferrohatis. I'm not going to go into the details of the nuts and bolts of how it happens because, as I was telling someone yesterday, you know, to you know, if I get into a, a you know a how it happened kind of thing, I mean, that's a it's 20 years of work, you know, and every single day there's a story, you know, so you know, so that could take a long time to do that. But I'm just going to go through some of the general things that happened there. One of the things that happened for me early on in this uh, search to try to figure out how to contextualize it and layer it with, um, with a deeper meaning was to, uh, uh, to identify it with this work of the artist John Biggers, who did a lot of paintings and, uh, paintings and drawings about shotgun houses, shotgun communities, and, and he helped me kind of understand the historical framework, but not only the historical, but the, the, uh, the poetic elements of of the shotgun houses, shotgun communities. And so I was able to start fairly early on, but it started out from the practical side, but fairly shortly after that I started to figure out how to layer in the symbolic meaning as uh, time went on. And, uh, and so that process, as uh, Shannon kind of laid out there, we said we started basically with um, a block and a half of little shotgun houses that was considered the worst uh, houses in the neighborhood because they were, um, it was a block and a, actually it was a part of a, about a four block area that only three buildings were occupied at the time. And so, so it was a, um, I mean it was a real need there uh, from a very practical standpoint. But then as you can see in these images here, in the process of kind of working on it, we started to just layer early on, trying to l get more meaning out of the work that we were doing. So if you, Start at the top on the left, you know, from the where, you know, it's original, and then you go down where we had started working, cleaning it up a little bit, and you go further, we start to layer it with, uh, you know, symbolic meaning through doing this thing we call a drive-by exhibition, and, uh, and then we start to layer it in terms of layering the community involvement and community support of it by doing something that we call the house challenge, where we got different groups to uh, to volunteer their services and come up with resources to renovate each house and so on and so forth. And, um, and then in pretty uh, short order of time, we were able to kind of reclaim this space as, a, as an architectural form within the neighborhood, but also as a place that housed different kind of programs. And, uh, and they were basically started out with a focus of three program areas. And the first one was... Uh, an arts program, there was an education program, and a trans and a housing program. And the um, <clears throat> what we did with the arts program, and what we still try to do with the arts program, is to have use these houses as a vehicle through which we can allow the community to talk and to speak through the artists that we bring in. So everybody comes with their own way of accessing people, and so we kind of get our, we kind of go around that whole thing of you know having to have community meetings all the time to do stuff because artists are basically field soldiers, you know, they're coming in, bringing their ideas and connecting with people in ways that help us stay informed uh, on uh, what's going on. And then education-wise, there's a big part of it is, you know, how do you catalyze the artists and the people that are coming into the neighborhood as resources to young people that are there. So, uh, mentoring and, and that, uh, and uh, formalized programs is a big part of this whole thing. In terms of you know how do you how do you how do you connect people? It's it's really a connect a connectivity to uh, things that people don't have ask, uh, access to. And then when the uh, we started thinking about a housing program, of course the obvious thing, the first thing that people talked about was possibilities of doing artist housing, but we didn't feel like that would connect strong enough with the the, the real practical issues that were happening in the neighborhood. So how could we find a way to get something symbolic out of it? I mean, so, so once again, you know, it was this notion of housing, a very practical thing, but then it was the question is, you know, so how do you do housing in a more complex way? How do you take it to a level that it has a symbolic uh, uh, aspect to it? And so what we did was we, we, we did our research and we realized that we could focus on a demographic that uh, could be used in a, in a symbolic way to talk about how do you care for people who are less well off in the community. We found that there was a high level of single mothers in the neighborhood, so we decided to do housing, transitional housing for single mothers. 
And the, and, and the way that we tried to layer that <clears throat> symbolically was to, to really take these little shotgun houses and work as hard as we could to renovate them in a way that kind of pushed the boundaries of what people think or thought, you know, uh, that were possible. And then you take these young women who are uh, basically, you know, you know they're, they're in very raw conditions, raw situation, situations, and try to elevate that and, uh, and, and symbolically show how the transformation of an individual can happen, just as the transformation of any other uh, 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 objects that people might want to might work in in terms of art. And so that set us in a, in a, in a situation where you know, we've continued to kind of explore and push the boundaries of this neighborhood and taking on the practical challenges as they come up. Uh, gentrification is, is a really big issue that has, has come up, and so we've had to enter into the realm of planning, which Houston is not a big planning place, so, but we're trying to kind of refocus things. If you see the, uh, this is a map that we kind of devised through some uh, community meetings trying to help people understand that the third ward is really too large to try to plan to make a plan for it as, a, as one neighborhood, so you need to kind of, you know, figure out ways to carve it up a little bit. And, uh, and so that was um, an effort there. And then we start to, so the area that we start to focus ourselves on is the area where Project Grow Houses is, which is uh, mainly, um, you know, these are the original houses here. Can you see that? No, no. Anyway, um, but uh, yeah, so you know, so there's there's like the original site here. And we have property throughout. And it's connected in this historical uh, on this historic street. And one of the things that we're actually working hard right now to do is to reframe how that how the neighborhood gets redeveloped. Um, of course, when people say that there's no commercial um, uh, or retail opportunities in the neighborhood. Then people start thinking, well, how do we get them? How do we get them? And the first thing they think about, in terms of food, for instance, they think, you know, oh, we should get like a Whole Foods, or whatever, these large-scale uh, big box stores. But we were thinking about the notion of character of the neighborhood and how it was, how it once survived as a series of places where there were small-scale uh, businesses, and, uh, and, and it was a place for people to exercise their desire to be entrepreneurs, to be producers within the neighborhood. So then we said, we started saying that we would start to uh, to incubate people, and so the, the the point that we're doing right now is going from a very practical standpoint of incubating these people who want to do business in the neighborhood, and uh, and trying to figure out as we go along how do we layer that with extra meaning. Uh, this particular, the one at the bottom, we have this great woman that started a uh, 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 a co-op, uh, uh, food co-op that's been working really really well. And, uh, and the challenge there, what we're trying to do now is trying to figure out how to make, how to get people to think about the financing of it. I, I was at a meeting a few months ago talking about this, this whole issue, and I was just kind of shot down saying that, uh, that investment money is so global that no one wants to take the time to figure out how to finance for the local. And so that's something that we're challenging. You know, we're trying to figure this out as we go along. On the upper right hand side is uh, is a uh, uh, an online radio station that uh, one of our uh, artists is doing, and so ultimately we end up with a um, you know a neighborhood that we're trying to build that symbolically represents something that is um, uh, that you know we, we like to think that it serves a practical function, but it also speaks symbolically about how. Uh, how communities can actually grow. So, as I said, you know, with Project Row Houses, I started out with the idea of um, uh, just focusing on the practical and trying to figure out how to layer in the symbolic. But then I had a chance later to work on, uh, to do a proposal, and the project didn't get built. Um, or it didn't, we, didn't, we, we didn't actually get to do it. We were actually selected to do it, but we is Walter here? Walter Hood? No? Uh, uh, um, Walter and I were uh, both, um, uh, we both responded to this request to do proposals for this site, and, uh, and, uh, and we, we were both finalists, and they wanted us to work together. And, um, and at a certain point, I decided that we didn't want to work on it. We uh, walked away because there was this notion of, 
you know, the question of whether this group that was trying to do this, if they had genuine interests, or if it was this kind of artificial interest to kind of be, to represent themselves in an artistic way. And, uh, but this, uh, you know, so this project, that it's, I'm going to just, yeah, I'll go through it and see if we can, you can kind of see what, where my thinking is around this, right? So they had all these lofty goals on what they wanted to do uh, in terms of uh, integrating arts into, into their community. And uh, <clears throat> the focus area was this triangle. They call it the, the triangle in uh, Opalaka, Florida. And, uh, and they had these, these little, where the circles are, represents uh, uh, areas that they wanted to do, quote unquote, public art. And, uh, and the ones one through four, they were all at dead end streets where apparently crime and violence had gotten so bad in that, that area that they actually blocked off those streets so that people couldn't move through. Everybody, if you went in on uh, 22nd Avenue, you have to go back out to 22nd Avenue to get around to the other side because they had it blocked off. But they felt like it was a time that they could actually open it up and, and do something a little different. And, uh, and so, you know, in, in the way that I work and the way that I think about this kind of work is that, you know, you have to draw as much on the local as possible. So we put together a team of people, and there's some project where has these folks, but also a lot of local people. And actually, we we're very fortunate that, uh, I don't know if you know, William Cordova, who's a, 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 he's based mostly in, in Miami, but he, he actually grew up in this neighborhood. And so, you know, we had this really wonderful team of people and we started to challenge the idea of basically doing sculpture at these, these corners. And also, because what, what they were requiring of the sculptures at the corner were to take down these buildings. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, you know, and, and the buildings were not so much, um, you know, they didn't have a lot of character or anything. But one of the things that, from a practical side, what we found when we were walking the streets and talking to people is... Um, People kept saying two things over and over and over. Uh, the first thing they would say is that, well, I know what you guys are really doing. You guys are just really here to just run us out. You want, you want us out of the neighborhood. So they knew that. You know? and, and then the second thing they said is that if you really want to do something, people need jobs here. I mean, that, you know, people need jobs. So we started to think, of, we started to take that to heart and start to think about, you know, so how do you frame a possibility that, uh, uh, that could address these practical needs, but also has an aesthetic uh, side to it. So we started to go into the, on the outskirts of the neighborhood, where these kind of, there was a, it's this neighborhood has become known for this kind of Spanish Moorish architecture. You know, and, you know, and of course, Florida is one of those places too that just kind of adopts all kinds of stuff, you know? And you, can, you know, you can drive down the street and you see something from anywhere, you know, it just happens to be there. And, uh, and so, so we, we thought we would kind of take off on that a little bit and start thinking about, since that neighborhood was predominantly African American, and start talking about, you know, the, 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 the patterns and the ways that people, you know, uh, design and, 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 uh, and, and painted houses in parts of South Africa or whatever. But what was most interesting about that wasn't so much the, the designs, it was mostly around the idea that, um, uh, that people were painting it themselves, you know, and that was the, the, the key thinking along there. So, so in our proposal, we, you know, we kind of suggested to them, you know, like these different kinds of things that, you know, didn't have to be any particular way. And, uh, and we went through a series of ways of showing them how you could take the fences and you could start to, you know, have train people. Um, because what we said, instead of doing these sculptures at these different uh, uh, points that they wanted to do, we would use the building to set up programs. Uh, there was one that we were calling a, uh, an employment zone, an education zone, an entertainment zone, and so on and so forth. And uh, but of course, in the employment and education zone, it's about you know training people to actually be able to do this kind of work, right? To take you know these sites and kind of teach people how to design them and how to actually you know do the actual work <laughs> to make the, uh, uh, the the transformations. And so, I mean, this is just all stuff that was from the proposal, you know, about, you know, people actually working on it themselves, you know, and this whole notion of um, 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 employment. And then, you know, and they were, they were showing things like at the top was they wanted to do this sports uh, facility thing, and they, but they would take down the little building at the bottom. And we were saying, you know, no, keep the building, you do something with it, and you look at the things that were already happening in the neighborhood, and you integrate that in a, 
in a different way. And uh, <clears throat> let me kind of go through this real quickly. Um, you know, and these are, this is typical of the, 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 the way the streets were blocked. And, uh, and we were showing how, you know, the process of, in the employment thing is about, you know, landscaping. You know, how do you teach people how to do landscape? And how do you allow them to teach you about, you know, the landscaping of a place? They, people, know their, people know things about their own place. And, uh, and so, and then these last three slides, I'll just show you how we just kind of get people to think about how it's not like a, you know, a one-time thing. It's a process of getting people engaged and having them involved in working in their community, and it can evolve over time and transform in a lot of different ways. So you take this site, and at some point, you know, you have, you know, a few little murals of things, and you can start the landscape, you know, and then, of course, as you continue in gentrification, you can't keep it off, then you get your duba phase and that kind of stuff. <laughs> <laughs> but, anyway, but it was just kind of, you know, and, uh, and we were very excited about the, you know, the possibilities of actually, you know, doing that, you know, that project. But like I said, there was, there was that question, though, for, for us, you know, you know, do these people really, 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 are they really genuine in their desire to do something that, uh, that will engage in, in something that will have value and meaning for the people that live here? Or are they just kind of trying to go from a, 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 a kind of a superficial level to which they wanted to use art in order to uh, forth another agenda? And um, <clears throat> so that's, so the, the, the last, um, uh, project here I'll show, let's see, what's the last one now? let's see, uh, now, where am I? Yeah, so, so in between, you know, doing different kinds of projects, I also just kind of explore on a smaller scale, you know, this notion of, you know, how do you focus on things and show value in different ways and, and see what comes out of it. So a couple of things that I've been working on uh, over the years is this is one uh, kind of like the people that I showed earlier that I observed, but these I, I'm going to show three that I actually observed and tried to really kind of layer something into their lives in a more intentional way, and uh, so that other people can see it outside of myself. So this guy he would play his saxophone you know along the street, and uh, and a lot of people thought he was kind of nutty, but one of the things that I noticed was that there were a lot of houses burning in the neighborhood, and he would always be there playing a saxophone, you know, at these, these house burnings. And so I started to photograph him, right, and started to capture him and make these kind of uh, posters that we could put around the neighborhood, just in a way to, to contextualize him in a different way, you know, and, uh, and it started to have, have its impact. And so I went, started thinking maybe I should just try a little more, and this one is uh, a guy, he actually died uh, two years ago. But he showed up at Project Horizons in oh, the late 90s, and uh, he had been in prison for a number of years, got out, and didn't really know anybody. Uh, most of the neighborhood had changed. And, um, but someone told him if he came and hung out around Project Horizons, he could do positive stuff, and we would help him, you know, keep him out of trouble. And so he, he showed up, and he, was such a, he had such a nice spirit about him, you know, this great smile, and, and uh, so after about a year or so, a couple of years, I started to uh, give him a little money for some of the things that he would do for us. And every time I did, he would always come back with a big like, plate of barbecue, you know, this big smile. You know, and I would tell him, I said, no, we didn't, I didn't give you the money to spend on us. You should just, you know, spend it on yourself. And he was like, no, I like to cook, you know. And, and so one day I asked him, I said, you know, I thought I should invest in him a little bit more. And I asked him, I said, so what would, if you could start your life over, what would you like to have been? You know, and what, what, what would your dream have been? He said, well, you know, since I like to cook, maybe I would like to have a cafe. And so I started thinking about, you know, how could I kind of help him, you know, and even just from a, from a, from a, from a, uh, 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 in an artificial way, you know, and this actually, this one actually started with the intent to try to help him, but it really kind of took off more in, in a symbolic way from, the first image that we made of him, you know, of trying to, you know, of making an image of him in the way that he, you know, saw himself in his highest form. And, uh, and so this started out as just kind of posters, just like the other one, you know, just kind of having posters around and people would all laugh and talk about it. But it eventually it actually evolved into something a little bit more meaningful for him, that he actually was able to, almost like a caterer, you know, I mean, he would certainly do things for Project Girl Houses, other families when they had things to do. And then, then people kind of caught on and they would 
supplies, aprons and t-shirts and mugs and that kind of stuff. And uh, you know, he had a great uh, he had a he had a great run there before he, he died. You know, to really kind of realize you know some value in himself and uh, and also as a, a valuable part of the uh, of the neighborhood. And then the final one, this one is this woman. Uh, uh, that I met who, whenever I would go to the laundromat, I would always, well, before I, before I started the laundromat, I would see her pushing a grocery cart down the street with these big uh, plastic bags. And one day I was at the laundry, and I was in a hurry, I had to leave to go somewhere, but, I, but my clothing needed to go in the dryer. So I saw her and I asked, I said, could I leave you some money and you put these in the dryer for me? And she agreed. And, uh, and so then I realized that she actually, that's, she kind of she did that to earn extra money. So I started, you know, bringing her in my clothing all the time. But then she disappeared, and uh, and I couldn't find her. And then one day I saw her and I said, you know, what happened? She said, well, she, she's been run off from the different uh, laundromats because people think that she's stealing the customers because she's hanging out there. They won't let her stay and wash and that kind of stuff. And one of the things that was happening at Project Grow Houses at the time, as we were building new houses, we we were building them in a way that 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 we didn't have washers and dryers inside the house because we wanted to have a laundromat as a kind of a social engagement space. And so she became a vehicle to think about, you know, how do we design our, uh, our laundry facility around this person who's a, already a community icon. And so she became, you know, the kind of icon for uh, the laundromat. And, uh, and so it's become her space. Uh, you know, it tells, you know, when you go into the space, you get to know her history, her story, uh, also the history of the, the, of the building, but also, in, and so it's given her a sense of, you know, kind of uh, an identity and a value that is, uh, is beyond what she had uh, had before. So, so now I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show another project that, uh, the last project I'm going to show is one that I'm really wrapped into now. It's in Dallas. I was invited by the National Sculpture Center to... Uh, to explore a project in a neighborhood uh, in conjunction with the 10th anniversary. And so, what I, what I, this project was also one of those opportunities where I could kind of think about it uh, beforehand, both, you know, you know, the practicalness, the genuineness of, you know, trying to figure out something with this neighborhood, but at the same time, simultaneously thinking about the, uh, uh, you know, the aesthetic, the symbolic uh, parts of it. And so, it became a real interesting, uh, captivating thing for me. And I, but just to give you a little background, when I started out, uh, they took me to this neighborhood. And if you see like all the blue area, that's all housing there. It's one of the most dense, densely populated uh, areas in Dallas. It's a fairly small area with like, 15,000 uh, apartments uh, in, in, that, in that area. And, uh, and it's slowly being gentrified. There's like, even like a Whole Foods on the edge of it. And, so lots of, lots of things around it, but in the core of it, it was built as high-density apartments for young, graduating college uh, students, and probably mostly white, in the 1970s. And, um, but over time, through the, the, uh, uh, throughout the, until you know, the early 1990s, late 80s, early 90s, of course, depreciation happened, so the value goes down. And then Fair Housing Act kind of made some tweaks in which, you know, it, didn't allow for these apartments to serve this kind of single uh, community. And so many of the apartments were redone and opened up to families. So then it, lower income people started to move in, lower income white families, uh, African American, Latinos. Then in the 90s, more immigrants start coming in. And, and, um, and then in the um, uh, around 2000 or so, the International Refugee Committee, along with uh, Catholic Charities, decided that this would be a good neighborhood to place refugees from around the world. And so, so they, you know, all these you know, refugees uh, are now living in this garden apartment environment, which was designed for people to drive their cars in, park the car, go to their apartment whenever they need things, to get in a car and drive out to different parts of the city. But, and so it had no public amenities, sidewalks not you know, you know, really designed for people on the sidewalks. You know, it's just kind of a, not a good situation for the people that are living there. So I thought, you know, that's an interesting thing. But the other thing that was interesting about it is that when people talked about it, they only talked about it in terms of crime and violence. And you could, you, I didn't, 
I didn't necessarily feel it when I was there, but you could see the apparatus, you know, around it, you know, and this is kind of to reinforce that you're in a dangerous place, even though I never quite felt uh, threatened when I was there. And, uh, and so I, I, I saw that as an interesting problem because this neighborhood was um, uh, one of the most diverse neighborhoods in the city, one of the most diverse uh, concentrated areas of people that I've seen because, I mean, they're literally refugees from all over just compacted in there. You just see people on the streets. And, uh, and so, you know, the, 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 the way that most people were thinking about it was that you need police to kind of police the place and keep it safe. And, uh, but there was actually another group that was doing something that was kind of interesting, uh, a different approach, a group called the Vickery Meadow. Uh, this is in Vickery Meadow. And also, by the way, this is a neighborhood where the Ebola uh, breakout happened. Uh, the first Ebola case happened uh, in Dallas. But, uh, but this, this, there was a group that basically said, you know, maybe, uh, maybe there's a, a different way to think about you know, the, the crime situation. As, um, uh, you know, so the Vickery Meadow Youth Development Foundation, they work with youth, but they decided maybe we should do something with the parents as a way of getting to the youth. And so what they said was like, maybe the problem is people don't get, they don't know each other. So how do we create a, a way for people to get to know each other? So they had this thing, they started this thing they call the Mom's Lunch, in which they would bring about four to five, I mean five to six different countries on Wednesdays with about, you know, four to five different women from those groups, and they would have, they would have a conversation. You know, they would all talk about their lives, their families, their journeys, and all that stuff. And, uh, you know, I tried to get to those meetings, but it was only for women. And, uh, but, at, but at a certain point, I think I won a, uh, one person over, and they said, you know, okay, we well, can come, you can sit at the back. And, uh, and I sat at the back, and, you know, and I was experiencing what I thought was one of the most, you know, because I was, I was focusing it through my desire to see the beauty and the aesthetic and things around me. And, uh, and it, was, it was like theater. It was the most beautiful moment of listening to, uh, to well, first of all, listening to the stories. They were all heart wrenching. But also just the, the, the formality of it, you know, where everything had to go through English. And then when it went through English, it went back out. Then every other language translated for translating. So sometimes I would just close my eyes and I would just hear the sounds, you know. It was really beautiful. And I thought, you know, this is, you know, this is a, if this could, if I could present this, you know, this would be an amazing piece. I mean, this is like, you know, this, you talk about real and uh, genuine and authentic. I mean, that was one of the most that I'd ever had. And so how do I capture that without exploiting? And so the other thing I started to notice was that there were people on the streets trying to, you know, doing what was familiar to them, trying to sell things on the street, natural entrepreneurs. And, uh, and so we I was talking to a group of people, I pulled together a group of artists to help me think about this, and we came up with this idea that maybe what that neighborhood, maybe if we could do a market in that neighborhood, it would be an opportunity for people to come together and, and interact and, uh, and get to know each other, and that would also contribute to the lessening of the uh, uh, crime in the area. And so we literally went, you know, on the streets, in meetings and continuously talking to people and trying to get them to uh, 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 trying to get a sense of whether that would be something that people would engage with us in and, and if it would have any real value. And part of it was figuring out, you know, how do we what what happens at what happens at the market? How do we get things to the market? Who who brings things to the market? And uh, and obviously our thinking was that it should be the people that live there should be the people that are bringing things into the market. So how do you get that? And you go to these you go to you go to meetings and you talk to people and you ask them if they make arts and crafts and they kind of look at you with a blank, you know, stare. They don't really understand this notion of art. And uh, uh, but one day, uh, one of uh, our team members was at a meeting and she saw this lady on the upper right and she had, she had been asking them if, they, if people did any crafts and stuff and she got blank stares. And then she was walking around and she saw this woman's uh, handbag and she said, "Where'd you where'd you get this handbag?" And she said, "Oh, I made it." And she was like. But that's what I was trying to say. You know, how do you, you know, do you guys? I mean, this is beautiful. I would buy this if you, you know. And uh, and and then so once we so so we started finding more and more people that we were able to talk to about it. But then we said, well, maybe what we should do is we should also set up workshop spaces within the neighborhood and uh, 
and once people can see it, then maybe they'd understand a little bit better. So we ended up setting up some workshop spaces, and it started out with artists from around the city of Dallas teaching them, but very quickly, uh, people from the, from the neighborhood actually start showing up and kind of leading the workshops and teaching and uh, showing, uh, showing, and basically taking, taking that over. But, uh, but so once we did a, a lot of the work kind of internally, we wanted to, to make it a more public thing and figure out how that could happen. And, and the challenges were that people said that, that the neighborhood was so violent and people didn't get along and it wouldn't, you know, people wouldn't come together and certainly people wouldn't come from outside of the neighborhood to go and that kind of stuff. And, uh, but we thought we, needed, we owed it to ourselves to give it a shot. So we had something, we did something that we called, the first one we did was around, the focus was food. We called it the Lucky Pot. And, um, and uh, we thought, you know, if we could get, you know, six or seven people from different countries to make food and, uh, you know, and we'll kind of fill in with other uh, kinds of food that we could just, you know, cater. And we could try it out. Well, we put the call out and we ended up getting 17. Uh, people that showed up, and uh, and then and we and we held that market, and it was just it was it was mind blowing for the people that that showed up. One of the one of the one of the most telling um, moments of this 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 particular thing was uh, was earlier in the day as we were setting up, and there was this young young kid. He was maybe 18, 19 years old. He uh, was hanging out with a bunch of his buddies, African American guy. Uh, no shirt, you know, sagging pants, and he was all like being gangster like and you know, telling us like, you know, what the fuck y'all doing? You know, y'all don't know anything, you know, y'all gonna have some kush, you know, and like God, you know, all this kind of stuff, you know. And we're like, no, you know, we're we're just gonna kind of do our little thing here, you know, and, and uh and so they kind of went on. And we did this we did this event and it was interesting as we were cleaning up, it was dark, and somebody and we, we we rented well we Actually, we were given two apartments there to house our workshops in. And uh, after we were cleaning up, we were inside, kind of debriefing, and somebody knocked at the door. And coming from the door, coming at the, at the door was this, this young man, which was really interesting because he had come back. This time he was dressed in a shirt, you know, and he was all, you know, he looked like a kid when he came back. He didn't look like the gangster thing. He just came in and he says, you know, I was... Uh, Oh yeah, I didn't come to the thing today, and I was sick. I live right across the street over there. I was sick, but I was looking out the window, and he was like, "We ain't never had anything like that in our neighborhood." It's like, and he was just, he was so expressive about it, like, "This is like deep. I've never experienced this." And I was like, and it was really it was very moving to see that you know he kind of that he kind of got it, you know, and uh, and uh, and so that was you know that was encouraging for us to kind of continue along and we and uh, to do these workshops and to take that space. In fact, that. And then that tree, that tree there, uh, was actually considered the drug tree when we started. And people tried to discourage us from taking this location um, because they said it was a drug tree. But of course, we were starting this in in in, uh, in the middle of summer, and if you know Dallas, it's hot. So that tree is very meaningful for us. We we're going to have to you know duke it out with the uh, drug folks. And, uh, the shade there, but anyway, but it, but it ended up, you know, as we kind of moved in and started doing different things, it, uh, it just shift the whole vibe of that location. So then we we start moving forward into you know planning other events and how do we do them, and we want to start to layer it more with the uh, with the crafts and the, the entertainment. And in our earlier thinking, we were thinking about um, you know who do we get to perform? How do we you know, how do we do this in a way that is that, that, that we can do something that bring everybody together, that, you know, who's, who are the right performers? And somebody in our group actually suggested, well, and they were very quiet and shy about it. They said, you know, well, why don't we do a talent show? And we were like, a talent show? And so we were thinking about it, you know, we thought, eh, well, you know, it's, it's, we could do it much less expensive than we, you know, trying to hire people. So, 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 we, so we, we started to try it, and we, once again, we lowball, you know, we were thinking, you know, yeah, if we could get, you know, Ten or so people, you know, to do stuff, and uh, uh, the a couple days before the person who was assigned to kind of coordinate, said, you know, it's amazing we have like twenty something people that have signed up, and it turned out that you know we got the flyers and stuff, and the other thing too is working in this kind of community, trying to figure out how to communicate with all the different people. You know, someone was telling us like, well, you don't have to say a lot, just put their language on there. You know, just put it here so they, you know, and so you know, a lot of the, Acquiring and information was just kind of real sporadic kind of stuff, but, but it seemed to work because people respond to it. And, uh, 
And so, so we ended up doing this, um, you know, this market that had the music and stuff. And it was, once again, it kind of blew everybody away, you know, with the, I mean, larger crowds of people, you know, from all walks of life. Um, uh, the performers were amazing from, uh, you know, from a, the youngest being an 18-year-old little Somali girl who was kind of dancing and singing and whatever. And uh, all the way to an 86-year-old white guy who was doing a hokey pokey, and, uh, and then and then you had everything in between, right? From you know gospel rap to Bhutanese dancers, you know Asic dancers. I mean, it was just a you know. And what was really most amazing about that is that you know you have a context in which everybody's you know people that are there that want to see their group perform, but they're also seeing others you know perform at the same time. And so seeing people kind of mix in that in that crowd was really. Uh, uh, has been you know very interesting and even and, it, and, it, and it's also reflected in the workshops because people are coming to try to figure out how to learn something that they can use to contribute in, in the neighborhood I mean in their in their for their, their their family lives but there was one thing that happened in this process though for me <clears throat> so I'm thinking about it from a from a formal standpoint you know what does it what does it mean aesthetically and uh, and one of the things that hit me was that there were there seemed like there was a, an aesthetic moment that was missing because there were a lot of artists and artisans that were producing at a layer at a level that was probably higher than what uh, than, than just showing it on a table at a market so we said we need we need to somehow figure out how to show this work in a way that's that that elevates it uh, beyond just the you know the craft market and I was in a I was in a conversation with a friend of mine uh, from LA Mark Bradford who was a uh, uh, getting ready for a show at White Cube in, uh, in, in London, and we were talking about it. He was, he was you know, talking about the, the pricing of his work here, and I was going, you got to be kidding. I mean, it's, it's, it's amazing. And we talked about it, and we talked about this whole notion about how White Cube, you know, and how they just really have kind of, you know, capitalized on, on, the, on, on the terminology and really kind of made it hyper-commercial in a way. And so, you know, I ended up seeing, you know, Mark's show at, you know, White Cube, a uh, beautiful show, and of course, sold out, and work sold for more money than you can imagine, you know, it's like amazing. And, uh, and so I was thinking about, and I was thinking, you know, this idea of White Cube adds value to something, right? Once again, it's about focusing things and framing things in a certain way, and I thought, well, we need white cubes in Victory Meadow. How do we get white cubes? And so I went back to uh, went back and I started talking to architects and people thinking about you know how can we get a box? How can we get a white cube box? And, you know, twelve feet by twelve feet inside. That should be enough space. You know that we can have white walls and make it a white cube. You know, what, what can we do? And uh, and to my surprise, you know, we, uh, there was a group of architects that took that on and they came back and they ended up doing. This space, so there's Mark Bradford's white cube on the left and our white cube on the right. And, um, you know, and these white cubes became, uh, you know, kind of uh, public amenities along in, the, in, a, in, a, in a space that had no real public kind of amenities and uh, where people could actually, you know, uh, stop, engage, and interact along the way. But it also became a vehicle through which, uh, you know, different types of exhibitions could happen. Um, uh, from you know more you know formal exhibitions to you know very um, uh, experimental and also uh, opportunities for us to kind of once again focus on people like this guy is, is someone that we ended up focusing on framing him in a way that was uh, uh, that he had never really thought of as being an artist but it was a very he was a very unique guy in the neighborhood that apparently had started collecting plants from uh, uh, the corporate built buildings that are kind of on the outskirts of the neighborhood, where, where what what would happen is that when the plants get a little bit, uh, when they wither a little bit, you know, the corporations just move them out. And he was like, he grew up with his his, his mother dealing with plants and all, and he likes them, so he started to collect them and bring them back to life and sell them. And uh, and so so we worked with him to kind of help him kind of recontextualize himself as an artist. In fact, he's in. Uh, Carol Fletcher's uh, *The People's Biennial* that's in Detroit right now, and uh, you know, so, you know, so, so, really trying to, to, to create the situation where you know we could you know frame things differently and put people in different contexts. And these little cubes, uh, they sit there and they open all day long, you know, and people can kind of meander in and out. 
at, at this point, we only have three, but we're hoping that we can get another couple uh, down the line. And, uh, and people, you know, basically showing up from all over the city to be a part of this, um, uh, a part of the neighborhood. And, but, but after eight months of uh, markets, I don't even know how many uh, workshops and socials and those kinds of things that we were doing in the neighborhood, then all of a sudden it came, I had to pull myself back to kind of assess and think about this notion of, um, of the practical and the symbolic and finding the balance. And one of the thing, things I ended up doing, you know, I ended up making this little drawing for myself to just kind of think about it, right? It's like, you know, this, so that I, it's, it's kind of like my gauge now that I use, like where, you know, if you take this as like the, the most practical, right? This is the most mundane practical. And, and at a certain point, you can plant the seed of an idea of something that has something symbolic, and it can grow, and it can grow. And you get to this point where there's this really beautiful, there can be this beautiful moment and mix where it's hand in hand equal. You know, it's symbolic, poetic, but it's also practical and so on and so forth. But then it can start, it can start to turn the corner, and it begins to be more symbolic, you know, more, um, uh, more symbolic than practical. And it can actually keep moving to the point that it loses all of its uh, practicality. And that, you know, I think about it, you know, that happens, that, you know, happens with even, you know, the best, the best art, when it gets to be so popular, it becomes mundane, right? I mean, it just, it loses its value. And it can come, but it can lose it, but it can also come back, you know, it goes back around. So I was thinking it's a, it's a, it's a circular thing, it just kind of moves. And so, as I started to think about this, I was thinking about how the, um, how the symbolic nature of what we were doing had become overpowering of the, uh, of the practical uh, aspect. And, and the way that I, I, I determined that is just kind of basing it on, you know, who's benefiting? I mean, where is the most benefit going? And at a certain point I started to realize that, uh, that the, the neighborhood in general, from a more real estate perspective, were beginning to benefit uh, in ways that exceeded the benefit of the, you know, the people that were at the bottom that we were really trying to, to, to create some practical opportunities for. And uh, just an example of how that happened was that, you know, all of a sudden, a very wonderful woman that runs a, uh, 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 a, a, a food market, you know, came to us and she was like, you know, oh, you know, I want to do one of the food markets in Vickery Meadow. Now, no one was talking about a food market in Vickery Meadow until, you know, so we started this kind of buzz around it. And then when the food market thing, as her concept kind of came up, then it just, it really didn't have any room for the people that were in the neighborhood. And it wasn't even really in the neighborhood, it was on the edge of the neighborhood. But it could use the name, you know. And so, so then we had to like rethink about how we, you know, how we do that. And so we actually moved ourselves off the street. Uh, we consolidated the white cubes. The white cubes were originally designed to run through the, uh, to move people through the neighborhood, but we consolidated a little bit more, and we we took a storefront, and uh, and with the storefront, we're focusing mainly on training people and not providing a market in the neighborhood, but getting their work out to the market, you know, and help, you know, because we think that, that will uh, will have a more direct impact on them as opposed to trying to bring people into the market. We're trying to get their work uh, uh, out to the market, so. So I, you know, so, you know, I've come to this point where I go back and think about this notion of, of the, um, uh, you know, the symbolic, the poetic, or the, uh, uh, the artificial, and the, uh, the genuine, the, you know, authentic, I mean, the practical, whatever, and, and I started thinking about this, you know, and how I fit within this. And I think of Meryl and her efforts as being one that is, you know, is, is deeply guided by this principle of being symbolic, you know, and so. And then, and then of course, Mr. Bentley, on the other hand, I mean, he's, you know, whether it's symbolic or not, it's not even a part of his, his language or whatever. And so I'm kind of, I try to keep myself kind of balanced in between there, where I can kind of say, yes, 
I do know that what I'm doing is, you know, it is artificial. It has this artistic context or whatever, and that's okay, you know. But at the same time, I have to really you know, be mindful of the fact that there is um, uh, a requirement for me as an artist to make sure that that kind of practical and uh, uh, genuine element uh, remains. Now, I'm going to close with a, uh, uh, a, a quote by, uh, that from that same article that uh, Lucy uh, Lepart wrote. And, uh, you know, she said, you know, for years I've been muttering about my long-stated desire to identify, quote-unquote, social energies not recognized as art. Works that erase art world egos and ambitions. What if we had no word for art? What, I mean, would a whole important area of our experiences vanish or open up? Land art is a good place to test the idea, since land artists often attempt to make their work look as though it had grown there rather than being artificially created. Would art be less artificial if it weren't art? And, um, and I would only just change her last statement just a little bit to just say, you know, would art be more genuine, authentic, or practical if it wasn't art? Thank you. take a few questions. We have a mic going around which will help people here and also help the uh, recording here. Can we up the lights too? <laughs> organizational and decision-making structures, in sort of, especially, I guess, in terms of your, uh, what your sort of initial in was in the Houston project, if you already had existing relationships in that neighborhood or with those neighbors with an organization there, and to what degree you're working with existing organizations there, like how you sort of enter and then how the decision-making happens throughout the course of the project. Um, <clears throat> you know, there, there's a, a number of Different ways that it can happen depends on the context. Uh, obviously, in uh, in Houston, I mean, it was my home, so I had a you know a great deal of uh, uh, connections with, in particular, with one of the local community centers in the third ward. So that was uh, you know that was pretty easy you know for me to kind of do that. And um, in other projects, oftentimes you know you rely on the institutions, but I can tell you, not all institutions are necessarily equipped to do you know to be able to. To, to provide that kind of connection for you. So, for instance, in the uh, uh, in the Dallas situation, I mean, I basically had to kind of um, uh, kind of figure it out because there was no infrastructure, you know, to support it. And um, but I tell you, the the, the, the main principles that I, that I have in the work that I that I do, and, and just in my life in general, I, I'm a big believer in uh, in having mentors. You know, and people that you can kind of, you know, that you, you can trust that they'll tell you when you're screwing up, you know. And, uh, and so in, in, in Dallas, uh, I have a couple of friends that I, that I really went to. And I said, you know, one who runs something called the South Dallas Cultural Center. And, uh, you know, I went to her and I asked her for her contacts and, and stuff to kind of get me in. And I basically, you know, we talk about it. It's like, look, I don't know what I'm doing here, you know, so kind of, you know, be my guide, be my force, until I can get other people into the into the uh, the process, and then I can start to invest, you know, those kind of decision make, making into them. And I just try to kind of play as far to the edge as possible, uh, being a supplier of, you know, this kind of I guess creative thinking, you know, and uh, sharing ideas and that kind of stuff. But I've never worked on a project where. People in a, in a community and people that have decided to be partners that I override them. You, know, you just have to allow people to uh, uh, to participate in a real way and uh, and be able to you know back that up and let them do it even when you think it's not you know the right thing.
Thank you for an incredible uh, journey through uh, different parts of the South. Um, you were in Florida. Were you in the town from Zodia Hurston? I know you mentioned Walter Hood, and I know he was down there doing something. Did you go to Eatonton? I know, I know Eatonville very, very well. Was anything uh, different from that city because it was uh, uh, so early uh, black independent and they formed? Anything different from that formation than the other cities you were looking at? Yeah, um, <clears throat> do, do you guys know Eatonville? Do you mind know Eatonville? It's, uh, it was, uh, basically Eatonville is, uh, uh, they argue to be the oldest incorporated black city in the country. And it also happens to be the home uh, of uh, Zora Neale Hurston. And, uh, and what you're referencing is true, is that from that legacy of being, um, uh, a, you know, a strong independent community. Uh, in fact, one of the, uh, Zora Neale Hurston was uh, Langston Hughes and Zora Neale Hurston butt heads all the time because, you know, she was not uh, an advocate for uh, integration. Mm -hmm. And basically based on the fact that she said, why do we need to integrate? We have a powerful, strong community. We have great schools and, you know, why do we, we need to do that? And, and I think some of that still linger, but it's still, but even with that, that sense of identity, it's still, you know, has the same problems that uh, communities across the country have where there's disinvestment, you know, and people are not um, uh, willing to, uh, to support them. And I, so I've, I've worked with myself, and uh, uh, if, if any of you go to Orlando, Eatonville is like a suburb of Orlando, you really should visit because uh, there's a woman who runs it, she's a very powerful force uh, in the modern theory, and she has, they have a, a, a the Zora Neale Hurston Museum, it's probably half the size of this space here, mm -hmm. and the exhibition space is maybe just this size, but you would, if you look at the roster of people that have shown there, from Karen Weems to uh, 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 Oakley, uh, has curated shows there, um, uh, Fred Wilson, I mean, every, you know, people are all shown there, and and uh, because basically people are, are connected to the identity and the history you know, of that place, but they struggle you know, tremendously to be able, and I, I don't know if it'll, if it'll sustain beyond the current generation. Um, I was really struck by your discussion of the, the politics, the decision making around genuine and artificial intent or politics, and so, when you were talking about, oh, they wanted to create these art spaces, and you showed us the design of like basketball courts. And so I guess I was wondering about how you decide, um, I guess, the politics of genuity or intent. Because it seemed to me in that example that what one of the things that you were resisting was sort of like a, an on top, like, here's our ideas for your community and how you should be using the space. And, and then, in addition, you, you noted the deep suspicion in the community as well. And so I'm just wondering how you negotiate or navigate those politics of, well, they really are well-intentioned people, they just are, you know, helping, helping this, like outside force or development agencies or whatnot engage with the community versus just deciding to cut something off. Wait, so you're, you're asking how do I actually, how do I? Respond to that, or well, it just seems like you had examples of we were like, no, we're shutting it down. You're like this isn't working for us because the politics aren't going the direction that we'd like it to go. I, there's not the type of community engagement, or there's not um, an emphasis on the community and the community's ideas that outside forces are respected. Mm. Well, you know, I I generally try to. You know, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a big believer in trusting the community, you know, and, and allowing them to kind of, you know, lead the direction. And so when we were there, and, and it was so clear that the community was not engaged around 
these other things that they were talking about. I mean, they might be okay. I mean, people might like to have a big sculpture at a corner. They might. But it was not something that was driving them, that was going to really, you know, uh, uh, move them to, you know, to be engaged in a, in a process and, and, and really uh, involving themselves in the community. And so it became very easy to, to me to just follow that lead and say, you know. Now, I'll tell you, I'll tell you another story. About you know the thing about putting your foot in your mouth, uh, Vidra, where are you? You're somewhere. I was I, I was at a, 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 a conference that uh, they did yesterday at the uh, California Institute of Integral Studies. <laughs> okay, got it. Um, and uh, you know, and it's so funny. I mean. You know, I, I'm saying this now for her that she knows that, you know, I mean, I learned something yesterday, you know, and I always approach these things in a learning way, you know, when I was at, as I talk to you about this work, I'm not telling you stuff that I know, I'm telling you stuff that I'm, I'm practicing, you know, I'm trying to learn, to figure this out. And so I show up at this, this, this um, conference yesterday, and I was asked to be in a group that was to, you know, look at some ideas around something that was happening in the Tenderloin. And there were about eight people in the group, and uh, and one person in the group was hyper aggressive and just dictating everything. And I could see everybody around the table was a little bit annoyed. And so I put on my social practice hat. <laughs> I know how to do this. And so you know, I said, you know, because everybody's kind of saying, you know. They were trying to isolate her, I can tell. But I'm like, no, 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 let's do this social practice way. So I said, let, let's let her speak. You know, let's, let's let her, let's find out what it is that she wants. And, and, and she was kind of like, I said, she was like, and at some point she said, she said, well, you know, this is the first time anybody's ever asked me <laughs> what my view was. You know, what, what my view was. Whatever. And there I am with my social practice experience, patting myself on the back. You see, this is how social practice happened, right? But what I did not know, and it happens all the time, but you know what? And I was just reminded, you know, the lessons that we learn, we have to learn them over and over and over and over and over. You know, they happen every day. But I didn't, I just blindly forgot the fact that, you know what? You don't know the context of this situation. You do not know these people sitting at the table. These people might know each other, whatever, whatever. And so I proceeded to try to, you know, social practice it around until a woman, she just got like, you know, her blood pressure was up and she was one. And I'm like, oh, but we can get her to come. And she just was like, I told you to just not talk to me anymore. And all of a sudden, so I turned and I was like this real enemy of the woman. And it was, it was very interesting. I mean, I, I, hope, she, I hope she didn't, I hope she didn't, uh, I hope her health didn't fail her in that process. But, but it was, but it's one of those things that you know you just have to, have to, you know, you know. I mean, you have to follow people. And she, that woman, taught me, and that program taught me that you know what, you just still have to listen, and you gotta be able to, you know, take people for what they say, you know, as well as you can. You know, I mean, but you also have to push them too. But there's always lines that you go over, you know. <laughs> so it's always a learning uh, opportunity. So I don't, you know. One, I wanted to say I was one of the people in that workshop with you yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> I thought you were familiar your hair now, but you didn't have to do that. I thought you did well. It was a difficult situation. <laughs> Yeah, but you guys could have pulled me to the side and say, you know, okay, buddy, cool it. I'm here for one day, so I was, I was a little rattled myself after that. Um, I was wondering, have you done any of these projects internationally, or do you have an interest, or have you been invited to do them outside of the U.S.? Yeah, I've, I've worked. I'm working on a project with um, uh, architect designer Keon Park. You probably know Keon. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Was he in your group? No, he was after me too. He was after you. Yeah. Okay. Um, but yeah, um, yeah, I worked. I've, I've worked international. I've worked um, a bit with Jonathan Hiswick in uh, Holland. You know, but um, 
So, but it's always, but it's, it's, it's really, it's, you know, I do, when I do work like that, it's much more kind of for the experience and trying to, you know, figure, I don't, I don't really have, you know, a strong sense that I can be impactful in the way that I am here because it's, there's, you know, there's the cultural differences, there's the, you know, barriers of, you know, how much time you can spend. And to me, a lot of the work that I do, and I'm really, I'm, you know, it's really about putting in time, you know, and, uh, and, and having that be a major part of it. So it makes it, a, you know, difficult to do. But I do it. But it's probably a little bit more <coughs> consulting or sharing ideas or, yeah, yeah. Yes, being embedded. Yeah, the, the thing that actually, in, but the other thing is, that, you know, the, the other reason that I do them though is that I always kind of, because, you know, if, you, if I think of it in terms of like, it's a body of work, right? And work is always influencing other work. And so, for instance, the project that I did in, uh, in, in, in Korea uh, in 2010, it certainly has influenced this notion around the small businesses that we're trying to do now. The project I did there was called Small Business Big Change because there were um, neighborhoods where they were taking out entire, because, because there's not a lot of developable land in Korea. And, uh, and so in order to continue to develop, they had to take out older neighborhoods and you know, build new. And, uh, but, and what's happening in those situations is they're taking out these places where people are losing not only their housing, but they're losing their livelihood. Because, you know, most of them are, you know, running little mom and pop shops. And so we, I did this, this project where I worked with a couple of students in art school and a business school, in which we went through to, um, uh, we kind of surveyed all the businesses in this district. Not all of them, but a bunch of the business in the district. And, uh, and we set up a competition because we realized that in order for some of these businesses to make their way into the new economy, they were going to have to change their way of thinking about how they do business. And so the students became a resource for them to look at from design elements, you know, how do you design your stuff? From a business side, you know, how do you look at, uh, you know, actually just teaching people, you know, simple things about um, uh, budgeting and that kind of stuff. So, and, uh, and, and what we're, the end goal that we we're hoping for was that some of these small businesses would be able to be incorporated as small businesses in the large developments that were happening. I mean, not all of them would, but some of them would. And um, uh, we, got a, we got a pretty good bite, because we only had a small budget. We were able to give one winner uh, $25,000. But the state, not the city, the state actually joined us and expanded it to five winners. You know, so we're, and, um, and, and it continues, from what I understand, it continues now. But the interesting thing about it is that no one sees it as an art project now. You know, I mean, it was seen, and that's another thing, you know, at what point does an art project get, what point does the symbolic nature get in the way of the practical? You know, and, um, and I think that's a, that's a tough lesson for artists to learn, you know, that it can, ha it can have a life in a, in a real uh, practical world that's not connected to the symbolic. That, that happened at Project Four Houses with the housing stuff too. I mean, we eventually realized that in order to scale up the housing, now, it didn't necessarily need to be art. I mean, it could just be housing, you know? I mean, it served its purpose as a symbolic way to get, to get in a position where it actually could do more. Thank you. Thank you everyone for being here. Uh, we look forward to welcome you, you to more lectures and we might be able to take a few more one-on-one uh, -on -one questions if we haven't worked them too hard. Thank you.
Thanks.